Hey there, thanks for stopping by. I've got a great episode for you today. But before we start, I want to know a little bit more about you. Getting to know who Once Upon a Crime listeners are helps me to know how to make a show you'll love. So if you can do me a quick favor and head over to survey.libsyn.com slash once upon a crime and fill out a super quick survey, that would be awesome. I promise it won't take more than like two minutes of your time, if that, and it will help me immensely. That's survey.libsyn.com slash once upon a crime. You don't even have to remember that URL or write it down. I've included a link in the show notes. Thanks so much. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. Last week, I kicked off the new series, Cursed Hollywood, when I told you the story of a hit television comedy whose young actors all experienced hardship and tragedy after the curtain came down on their show. Hollywood, being a superstitious place, rumors began to fly that the show was cursed. The idea of curses plaguing Hollywood productions is nothing new. In this episode, I'll detail a case of an iconic Hollywood franchise that is still going strong today, but rumors of its cursed status begin as early as the 1930s. Some believe that the poor treatment of the original creators led to its long history of bad blood, shattered careers, tragic accidents, untimely death, and even murder. This is the curse of Superman. The character Superman predates even comic books, where most first heard of this cultural icon. Two friends, a writer and an artist, both science fiction fans, dreamt up the Man of Steel together. But it might surprise you to know that, at first, he wasn't a hero, but a villain. Jerome Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster met in Cleveland, Ohio in 1924. Both were of Jewish descent. Siegel, the son of Russian immigrants, and Schuster, born in Canada, hailed from Dutch-Ukrainian roots. Schuster's family moved to the U.S. and landed in Cleveland, where the boys met in high school. They immediately became fast friends, bonding over their love of science fiction stories. They were also fans of comic strips like Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, Tarzan, and Popeye. Together, they began creating their own comics for their high school newspaper. Their first collaboration was published in 1931. Siegel and Schuster aspired to be science fiction writers, but when they couldn't get anyone to publish their stories, they created their own magazine titled Science Fiction in 1932. In the third issue, their story, The Reign of Superman, featured the first appearance of the character. In their original story, Superman is created as an experiment by a mad scientist who endeavors to create the perfect human being. Superman has super strength as well as telepathic superpowers but he uses them not for good, but to destroy. It is clearly an updated science fiction take on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This story, as well as all the others the duo created, was rejected by every publisher. In the mid-1930s, comic books came on the scene. Now, instead of telling stories using comic strips or short pieces of the story over several weeks, they could be told from start to finish in cheaply produced comic books. Siegel and Schuster thought this would be the perfect vehicle for their Superman character, and they now expanded on the original story. They submitted it to a publisher who'd shown interest in their work, but ultimately the company passed on their comic book. Frustrated, they destroyed the first draft of their Superman book. Only the first page of the work survives today. The duo kept plugging away, trying to make it into the comic book business, with Siegel writing the scripts, and Schuster providing the illustrations. They succeeded at having some of their comic strips published, one of the first being Dr. Occult, the earliest character created by DC Comics, first published in 1935. With some success under their belts, they decided to dust off their first attempt at the comic book. Superman, at this time, took on the form we recognize today. He was now a crime-fighting superhero and was given a science fiction backstory now familiar to millions. But just in case you're unfamiliar, here's a summary. He was born on the planet Krypton, and when it was in danger of being destroyed, while still a baby, he was rocketed to Earth by his parents. 
he lands in a field in America. There, the baby is discovered by a kindly couple, the Kents, who name him Clark and raise him as their own son. He will later move to the big city and become a bespeckled, mild-mannered newspaper reporter. He keeps his superpowers hidden and only dons his superhero costume to become Superman when necessary to help people in imminent danger or to fight crime. Schuster and Siegel sold their Superman comic to the newly minted Action Comics, the fourth title under Detective Comics, Inc., later simply known as DC Comics. DC wanted a great new story for Action Comics' first issue, and the duo got their first big break. Superman made its debut in Action Comics issue number one in June of 1938. The comic was a huge hit right away, and the public clamored for more stories. Before long to keep up with the workload, Schuster and Siegel hired out extra help to draw and ink the comics. Several spin-off comics were created, including Superboy, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, these were the titles, and finally Supergirl was created, but not until 1972. Everything should have been rosy for Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster now. They were living the American dream. Unfortunately, when they were first offered the contract with Action Comics, they were so excited about being published after so many rejections that they signed on the dotted line without paying much attention to the fine print. That fine print stipulated that all the rights to their characters and everything associated with them went to the publisher. Everything created under the name or the likeness of Superman or any of their other characters, which included toys, lunchboxes, dolls, whatever else could be made out of cheap plastic materials that kids snapped up as soon as it hit the shelves, well, old Jerry and Joe wouldn't see a dime of any of that money. Zero zilch. Take that as a lesson, all you creators, artists, writers, podcasters. Never sign without knowing what you're signing. Yikes. The boys thought they had scored a big paycheck with the first comic book they created. For the concept, story, and illustrations, they were paid a whopping $130, or about $2,300 today. They continued to be paid a pittance compared to the fortune the Superman comic book franchise was making. Over time, they gradually lost control of their creation entirely. More of the work was outsourced by the publishers, especially after Schuster began to lose his eyesight. Then World War II hit, and Siegel was drafted into the army. DC took advantage of these events to replace the creators. They were no longer consulted about the storylines or artwork. Also, whatever Schuster and Siegel weren't directly involved in creating, DC didn't have to pay them for. They had found a loophole to effectively cut them out of the creation of Superman altogether. They filed a lawsuit against DC for what they believed should be their portion of the earnings from the Superman comics. In 1947, the court ruled that the contract they signed with the publisher was clear. They were not entitled to any of the money earned under the Superman brand. They were sacked by DC, and, to add insult to injury, their names were now removed from the comic book credits. Schuster left the comic industry, disillusioned by their treatment by the corporation. By 1954, he was rapidly losing what was left of his eyesight. Desperate to earn money before he could no longer work at all, he was hired by a friend to illustrate a series of semi-pornographic comic booklets titled Nights of Horror. The booklets featured stories and pictures depicting bondage, torture, sex slaves, and other sexual content. However, there was very little nudity. It was the 1950s, after all. Still, the books were banned by the city and state of New York for violating obscenity laws, and the publication was shut down. Nights of Horror and comics like it were even said to have played a role in the trial of the Brooklyn Thrill Killers, a gang of teenagers who tortured several men and killed two in the summer of 1954. Nights of Horror was specifically named as a comic inspiration for the violence and depravity the boys exhibited. Prosecutors would claim that it directly led to the ringleader's sexual perversion that spurred him and his crew on to commit murder. Siegel continued to write stories for comics, albeit under a pseudonym, since he'd been blackballed by the industry. He wrote for Charlton Comics, Marvel, and Archie Comics, among others. In the 1970s, he also wrote for Disney's comic division in Italy. However, he was unable to get his own original creations published. In 1978, Siegel and Schuster took another try at suing for their original Superman idea when the first of the blockbuster Superman movies was set to debut. 
DC Comics still maintain that they didn't owe the duo anything, but when news of their lawsuit hit the papers, DC wanted to avoid bad publicity before the movie's release. They made Siegel and Schuster an offer. They were each provided with a lifetime annuity of $30,000 plus health benefits. It was a drop in the bucket of what the Superman franchise would ultimately be worth, but they were senior citizens now, and it would be enough for them to retire, if not in luxury, at least not penniless. Their names were also returned to the byline in the comics, starting on issue number 302 in August 1976. Joe Schuster became completely blind and died in 1992 at the age of 78. Jerry Siegel died in 1996 at the age of 81. The duo was honored in Cleveland in 2005 when two streets were named for them, Jerry Siegel Lane and Joe Schuster Lane. Most who believe that the Superman franchise suffers under a curse trace it back to the unfair treatment of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, Superman's original creators. It's been noted that from that time forward, many people associated with the Superman franchise have experienced tragic accidents, illnesses, and death. Here are a few of those stories. Brothers Max and Dave Fleischer founded an animation studio in 1921. Originally called Out of the Inkwell Studios, it was renamed Fleischer Studios in 1929. Fleischer Studios produced some of the most popular cartoons in animation history. Betty Boop, Popeye, and Superman were all created by Fleischer Studios. Two of the Fleischer brothers, Max and Dave, ran the company together. Fleischer Studios entered into a contract with Paramount, which provided financing and distribution. Popeye was the most popular cartoon of the day. The tattooed, spinach-eating sailor was even more popular than Mickey Mouse, according to audience surveys throughout the 1930s. The Fleischers had petitioned Paramount for financing for a full-length cartoon movie, but the studio wouldn't greenlight the project until the success of Walt Disney's first feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, in 1937. In 1938, Fleischer Studios released its first animated feature film, Gulliver's Travels. It earned more than $3 million upon its release. About the same time, the studio acquired the rights to produce an animated Superman series. Also at this time, Fleischer Studios moved its headquarters from New York to Miami, Florida. Soon after the move, things began to fall apart for the Fleischer brothers. They were already under a great deal of stress producing their first feature film. It went way over budget, and while it was a success, Paramount penalized the studio $350,000 for the added time and expense. The original budget was $500,000. The Fleischers had to use revenues earned from the Popeye cartoons to pay off this debt, as well as another $250,000 for costs incurred on the creation of other cartoons rejected by the studio in 1940. Fleischer Studios also experienced a worker strike in 1937, when its New York employees hit the picket lines complaining of long hours and unfair pay. The strike lasted for five months and cost the studio time and money as well as bad blood between management and employees. While the Superman cartoons were a hit with the public and critics alike, it would be nominated for an Academy Award in 1941, Paramount had to continue to advance money to Fleischer Studios to keep them afloat. But in 1941, still in debt to Paramount and unable to earn enough to reimburse the company, Paramount acquired Fleischer Studios. Max and Dave Fleischer had a lifelong rivalry and had often butted heads about one company issue or another over the years. But in 1939, the final straw was reached when Max berated Dave for his very public extramarital affair with his secretary, May Schwartz. The brothers would stop speaking to each other altogether by the end of that year. Dave would eventually marry Schwartz, but the damage to the brothers' relationship would never be repaired. The Fleischer's last project was the feature film Mr. Bug Goes to Town, slated for release at Christmas of 1941. Its debut was held up until the spring of 1942 and never recouped its cost to the studio. Max Fleischer was asked to resign a month after Dave handed in his resignation in 1942. Paramount removed the Fleischer name from the company and rechristened it Famous Studios. Max's son-in-law was made director of the newly named company. Max took a job in Detroit producing Army training films. 
he spent the rest of his life trying to regain ownership of his Betty Boop character, which had become famous worldwide. Merchandise was being sold without his authorization, and for which he was receiving no compensation. Fleischer died in 1972. His family would continue to fight for the Betty Boop franchise and would eventually win their suit, but would only do so after Max Fleischer's passing. Dave Fleischer became a producer for Columbia Pictures and produced two features which were both nominated for Academy Awards. Even so, Columbia fired Dave in 1944. He tried to sell other concepts to animation studios with little success. He produced a comic strip for a Hollywood newspaper for a time. He was also hired to produce short theatrical promotions for Filmat Company in Chicago. He was the animator for the now-famous Let's All Go to the Lobby short cartoon, a reel played before the feature film in movie theaters around the country. You know it. The hot dog is on the swing and jumps into the bun at the end. It's playing on the screen behind John Travolta as he belts out Sandy Baby at the drive-in on Grease. Yeah, that one. Of course, he wasn't credited for the short reel, and until just now, you probably never knew or even thought about who created it. Dave Fleischer finally landed a position as a technical advisor at Universal Pictures, where he worked on the films The Birds and Thoroughly Modern Millie. He died of a stroke on June 25, 1979. He and his brother never spoke again after their falling out in 1939. Dave Fleischer thought acquiring the rights to create a cartoon feature for the Superman comics would be Fleischer Studios' crowning achievement. Instead, some believe it became a jinx that would open the door for the curse of Superman, effectively bringing an end to their partnership and their studio. From comic books to cartoons, Superman's run was fraught with problems. But the next medium that the superhero would conquer would be television. Now beamed into living rooms across the country, the curse of Superman would continue. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Italic. Italic offers luxury without the labels. It's the only way you can shop for beautiful, unbranded luxury goods straight from the source. You can purchase handbags, totes, and backpacks from the same highly vetted manufacturers as Prada, Celine, and Chanel. You can also purchase bedding from the same manufacturers as the Four Seasons and St. Regis. More categories and products are added every month. Guys, I love my new tote bag from Italic. It's made of soft, buttery leather, has beautiful accents, and top-quality hardware that came packaged so carefully, just as you'd expect from a top-quality manufacturer. When I shop online at Italic, it's like visiting a luxury store. Everything you'll find there is of superior quality and styling. I'm eyeing a couple more items, since I know that each product will meet or exceed my expectations. I've got my eye on a backpack tote that's produced by the same manufacturer as Chanel and Christian Lobaton. For a bag of this quality, I'd be looking at a price tag of around $600 to $800, but I can get something just as good for less than half that cost. And bragging rights for being a smart shopper, too. And a smart shopper knows the reason we pay so much for designer goods is for the quality and beauty of them, not the logo. And Italic isn't just handbags and bedding, but shoes, jackets, accessories, and more. Oh man, right now Italic has a beautiful leather motorcycle jacket. I'm telling you, you would pay about $1,500 for that bad boy, and you'll be shocked at the affordable price on this awesome item. But some items sell out quickly, so you'll want to go right away to see the products currently available. For the first time ever, Italic is offering a $15 credit for you, my listeners. Go right now to italic.com and use offer code ONCE for $15 off your first order. That's italic.com and use offer code ONCE. We'd also like to thank Native. Native's deodorants are made without aluminum, parabens, and talc. I love that Native formulates their products with fewer, simpler ingredients so that you know everything that's in it. And their deodorants and other products are made with ingredients found in nature, like coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch. Did you know tapioca starch absorbs odor safely and effectively? True story. And I'm sure you all know that aluminum found in many deodorants has been linked to some serious health ramifications. And native deodorants work. I've been using them for about a month now, and I can honestly say I'm hooked. They smell great and outlast my longest days, even in a hot and stuffy recording studio. And people love these products. Native has over 8,000 five-star reviews. Their deodorants come in a variety of scents to choose from, whether you like the popular coconut and vanilla, or you're more a lavender and rose fan, or how about cucumber and mint? I'm sure you'll find several that you like, or even love. 
and there's even unscented. So become a fan of Native today, like me. There's no risk to try it. Native offers free returns and exchanges in the U.S. You've got nothing to lose. So go to nativedeodorant.com and use promo code ONCE for 20% off your first purchase. That's nativedeodorant.com and use promo code ONCE. And thanks for supporting the show. Bad deals and bad blood plagued the Superman franchise, but until the 1950s, it hadn't been connected to murder. Now it would be rumored that the curse of Superman was responsible for the death of a Hollywood star. The first man to portray Superman on screen blamed being cast as the Man of Steel for torpedoing his acting career. Kirk Allen performed in vaudeville and in chorus lines before following his friend Red Skeleton to Hollywood. He won the role of Superman for a Columbia Pictures film serial. It would be the first time Superman would be portrayed in a film. Allen would play the superhero in 15 short serialized episodes. The first was released in 1948. Allen had a career as a stage actor and dancer, which gave him an advantage performing the required stunts. His dancer's body helped him fit into the form-fitting suit and tights that was the Superman costume. The casting agent also thought he closely resembled Clark Kent from the comic books. But Columbia only produced two seasons of the series, and in 1951, his time playing Superman was over. But Allen was already tired of the role. He was not credited on the screen, his name only appearing on the movie posters. The public only knew him as Superman, and he'd grown tired of being associated with his character. So in 1951, when he was offered the role playing Superman on television, he turned it down. This turned out to be a mistake. Allen tried for other acting roles, but he'd been hopelessly typecast by the extremely popular character for which he was first associated. He had to make do taking voiceover roles and found some stage work back in New York. In the 1960s, he returned to California and was cast in a few television commercials. Playing Superman ruined my career, he later said. I was bitter for many years. By the 1970s, audiences were nostalgic for the films of the 1940s and 50s. Superman fever began when the 1978 film Superman was announced. Reporters sought out anyone connected with the original Superman productions, and Allen found himself in demand again at the age of 68. He was offered the role of Lois Lane's father in the new movie, which he eagerly accepted. He lived to the ripe old age of 88 and died in 1999. So maybe Allen suffered from typecasting, which can affect a person's career and their finances, as we learned in the first chapter of this series. However, in Allen's case, it wasn't life-threatening or even all that terrible, it seems. But the Superman curse was about to get much, much worse. In 1951, the first feature-length Superman movie was made for television. Titled Superman and the Mole Men, it starred 37-year-old actor George Reeves. George Reeves was born George Kiefer Brewer, on January 5, 1914, in Iowa. Shortly after his birth, his mother and father separated. Eventually, he and his mother Helen moved to California. There, his mother remarried. Frank Joseph Vesselow adopted George in 1927, and the boy was given his last name. Helen and Frank were married for 15 years before they divorced. George was away visiting relatives when his parents split up. When he returned, his mother inexplicably told him that his stepfather had died by suicide. It was several years before George learned that the man was still alive. Friends who knew Helen said that she was a very controlling woman, especially with her son, and this was just one example. I'd call it more than controlling. It's also, well, bizarre. George took to boxing in high school. He was tall and muscular and excelled in the sport. His trainer was preparing him to compete for the title of Golden Gloves champion but his mother said that he had a face that was too pretty for boxing and discouraged him. The Pasadena Playhouse was a cultural icon by the time Reeves was a young man. Premieres of plays by authors like Eugene O'Neill, Tennessee Williams, and F. Scott Fitzgerald caused young actor hopefuls to flock to the Southern California theater. Some who honed their craft on the Pasadena Playhouse stage included Victor Mature, Ernest Borgnine, Gene Hackman, and Dustin Hoffman. Reeves began taking classes there, and was cast in some costume dramas. He had a boxer's physique and was tall, 
reportedly six foot three inches tall, and had the chiseled jaw and classic features coveted by casting agents. He could play a heartthrob, a gangster, or a cop. Talent scouts frequently sat in on rehearsals and productions at the Pasadena Playhouse. Reeves was discovered there and signed on with Warner Brothers to appear in film shorts. His very first feature film role was as Stuart Tarleton in Gone with the Wind. In the opening scene, Reeves plays one of the red-headed Tarleton twins competing for the attention of Scarlett O'Hara. He and the other actor, Fred Crane, were made to dye their hair bright red, which appears orange on screen. When he was contracted by Warner Brothers, Jack Warner changed his name from George Besselow to George Reeves. He appeared in several films, playing a gangster alongside James Cagney. He was handsome, but his nose, previously broken in the boxing ring, gave him a bit of a tough edge. Reeves was on track to become a Hollywood leading man when World War II was declared. In 1943, he was drafted into the U.S. Army. However, as an actor, he wasn't sent to the infantry, but instead was enlisted in the Entertainment Corps, traveling with shows to entertain the troops. He was then transferred to the Army Air Force's first motion picture unit, where he acted in training films. Director George Sandridge, who worked with Reeves on the film Proudly We Hail right before he was drafted, told Reeves that he had big plans for him when he returned from duty. But when George finally returned to Hollywood after the war, Sandridge had died. Hollywood productions had slowed down considerably due to the war effort, and actors were now scrambling for roles. Studios were not hiring actors under contracts anymore, and Reeves had to take whatever he could get. He played a few B-movie roles before relocating to New York, hoping to land roles in stage plays. But when that didn't pan out, he took parts in live television dramas and radio plays to make ends meet. He returned to California in 1951 and was cast in a Fritz Lang film, Rancho Notorious. It was in June of that same year that he was offered the part playing Superman in a new television series titled Adventures of Superman. Reeves was a movie actor, at least that had always been his goal, and like many actors of that time, saw television as a step down, something reserved for less serious actors. However, with acting jobs few and far between, he reluctantly agreed to take the job. He first donned the red cape in the television movie Superman and the Mole Men, which would immediately be spun off into the series Adventures of Superman. No one could have predicted how popular the series would become or that Reeves would become a national celebrity. The show was an instant hit and would run for several seasons, from 1951 until 1957. George Reeves, as Clark Kent slash Superman, was loved by adults and children alike. He was a heartthrob, a patriot, and a superhero all rolled into one. As Clark Kent, he portrayed a self-conscious shy man who kept his feelings for Lois Lane hidden, even while she pined for his alter ego Superman. Sponsors loved it because the kids tuned in for the caped crusader, men tuned in for the action, and women for the romance. At least, that was their take on it in the 1950s. The point is, Superman became a huge hit in the television ratings and in merchandising like action figures and lunchboxes, and George Reeves became a star. But the shooting schedule was grueling, the pay was much lower than film actors could expect to make, and Reeves' contract made it difficult to take other acting work, even if it had been offered to him. But Reeves was finding out what Kirk Allen had already discovered. Once you portrayed the Man of Steel, you were forever cast in that role. Reeves was such a recognizable figure playing such a popular character that the studios no longer considered him for other parts. He earned extra income by making personal appearances. He was especially in demand for events for children, in costume, of course. Reportedly, Reeves was extremely gracious at these appearances and seemed to enjoy entertaining children. He would never have any of his own. The Adventures of Superman finished its run in 1958. George Reeves had played the title role for seven years. After the filming wrapped in 1957, Reeves went on the road with a group of actors and musicians to do a live show tour. The first half of the show was a live drama, where Reeves played Superman, while the second half of the act had Reeves returning to the stage out of costume, singing and playing guitar. He also sang on The Tony Bennett Show and played the role of Superman in an episode of I Love Lucy. While Reeves kept up his image as a clean-cut hero during the run of Adventures of Superman, the truth was he had been carrying on an affair with a married woman for years. His girlfriend, Tony Mannix, was not only married, but her husband was a powerful man in the film industry. 
Eddie Mannix was the vice president of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Tony Mannix was an ex Ziegfeld Follies girl and had been the mistress of Eddie Mannix for years before marrying him. She was eight years older than George Reeves, who she began an affair with in 1951. However, Eddie Mannix and his wife had an open relationship. Mannix was a known womanizer who conducted affairs with starlets and Hollywood hopefuls out in the open. Tony was allowed to have a boy toy in Reeves, and she and Reeves would even double date with her husband and his mistresses. Hollywood is a weird, weird town. Meanwhile, Tony Mannix had money to spend on her boyfriend, George. She set him up in a Beverly Hills home, leased him a car, and lavished him with gifts and vacations. Eddie Mannix was getting up in years and had already suffered several heart attacks. Tony fully expected she would marry George once her husband kicked off. George also seemed devoted to Tony. Perhaps it was a comfortable relationship for George, who had been used to his mother calling the shots for him until he was a young man. Now he just transferred the power and control over to Tony. But in 1959, Reeves met Lenore Lemon, a 36-year-old socialite from New York. Lenore was a well-known party girl who had the designation of being the only woman ever thrown out of the stork club for fistfighting. In 1941, she married Jacob Webb, the great-great-grandson of billionaire business magnate Cornelius Vanderbilt. They only lived together as man and wife for eight days. She was also married to actor Hamish Menzies from 1951 to 1954. Reeves was instantly smitten with Lenore, and soon after meeting her, broke the news to Tony that they were through. She was devastated and also angry. She had invested a lot of time and money into George Reeves, and in her opinion, he belonged to her. But George didn't waver. He loved Lenore and planned to marry her. Their wedding was set to take place in Mexico on June 19, 1959. In the weeks after George broke with her, Tony was inconsolable. She took to her bed, crying and refusing to see anyone. She would call Reeves upwards of 20 times per day, begging, pleading, arguing, threatening, and demanding he come back to her. George hid himself away in the Benedict Canyon home, a home Tony Mannix bought for him, by the way, leaving only to squire Lenore out on the town. On the night of June 6, 1959, three days before his scheduled wedding, George Reeves, his fiancée Lenore Lemon, and friend Bob Condon were all together at Reeves' house, located at 1579 Benedict Canyon Drive in Beverly Hills. Incidentally, this house is only a mile away from 10,500 Cielo Drive, the Tate Polanski home and the site of the infamous Manson family murders. Condon, a writer, was Reeves' house guest at the time. The trio had had a few drinks before going out to a restaurant where they continued to imbibe. At the restaurant, Reeves and his fiancée got into a loud argument. They returned to Reeves' home, a modest two-story, three-bedroom house. Condon and Lenore continued drinking and Reeves, saying he was tired, went upstairs to his bedroom. It was close to midnight. Later still, two neighbors, Carol Van Ronkel and Bob Bliss, arrived at Reeves' home. Carol was married, but sleeping with Condon, according to later reports. Bliss lived down the block, but wasn't well known to the group. They had heard the party taking place at Reeves' house, and joined Lenore and Condon, who were still drinking in the living room. As the party continued into the wee hours, Reeves came back downstairs, and complained about the noise. Lenore was able to calm him down, and he joined them for a drink before returning upstairs once more. Lenore complained of Reeves' bad mood and apologized for his behavior. As he headed upstairs, she commented to the group, There he goes. He's going to shoot himself. Police reports stated that the group could hear his movements upstairs through the thin ceiling. A drawer could be heard opening, upon which Lenore said, He's getting his gun out now. Suddenly, they heard a shot ring out. See, I told you so, Lenore reportedly said. Bliss ran upstairs and found Reeves lying across the bed naked. There was a single gunshot wound to his head, and he was dead. His feet were hanging over the side of the bed, as if he'd been in a seated position. While it was reported that Reeves went upstairs sometime around 2 a.m. and immediately shot himself, officers weren't called until later, not arriving until after 4.30 a.m., were the partygoers using that time to get their story straight or stage the crime scene as some would later speculate? After questioning the group, investigators chalked up the delayed response to their shocked state as well as their level of inebriation. It was reported that Lenore and her friends were very drunk when police arrived. 
Reeves was also found to have a blood alcohol level of what would now be considered twice the legal limit. An autopsy was conducted, and the medical examiner quickly concluded that George Reeves died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. The Nora story was that her fiancé was despondent over his inability to get new acting roles, having been hopelessly typecast as Superman. She also said that an ex-girlfriend, who she did not name, had been driving him crazy since they broke up. Lenore said she and Reeves had only been dating for six months and gotten serious quickly. The other woman couldn't accept that Reeves had ended their relationship. Of course, she was talking about Tony Mannix, who neither she nor the newspapers identified at first, probably due to the power her husband wielded in Hollywood. Reeves' former co-star, Jack Larson, who played Jimmy Olsen on Adventures of Superman, agreed with Lemon's assessment of the situation. He would be quoted saying that Reeves had made such a mess out of things that he could imagine his friend becoming suicidal. When asked to explain, Larson said that Tony Mannix was not only Reeves' girlfriend, but also his benefactor and biggest supporter of his career. She was connected to very powerful people in Hollywood, and when he threw her over for Lenore, he put himself in danger of losing not only his livelihood, but his career prospects in Hollywood. But other stories emerged about the unlikeliness that Reeves would kill himself. He was scheduled to participate in an exhibition boxing match the next day with light heavyweight champion Archie Moore, something his friends said he was looking forward to very much. While he had continued to audition for other roles, the studio was in the works, at the time of his death, to bring back the adventures of Superman for another season. Those who didn't believe the reports of Reeves being so despondent over his lack of career prospects pointed to this fact as contradicting the suicide story. They also pointed out that just hours before his death, Reeves had told a reporter that he was looking forward to a planned trip to Australia for a Superman promotional tour. He was considering a trip to Japan as well, where the television series was very popular. Finally, his marriage was scheduled for that weekend, and Lenore would be accompanying him to Australia afterwards. His mother Helen was adamant that her boy had not taken his own life. She was devastated by his death and poured her grief into launching an investigation into his death. Some other evidence came to light that would call into question whether Reeves had actually killed himself. First, Reeves' hands had not been tested for gunpowder residue. In fact, his body had been washed before his autopsy was conducted. While the top of Reeves' skull had been removed to examine the bullet wound, it had also not been checked for gunpowder residue, which would have been present if he'd been shot at such a close range. However, this can be explained by the fact that GSR tests were not routinely conducted in 1959. In addition, neither the police, the coroner, or anyone was thinking that this was anything else besides a case of suicide, and they weren't looking to form an alternate theory of his cause of death. Some also find it suspect that no fingerprints, not even Reeves, were found on the gun. While witnesses said they'd heard only one gunshot, two additional bullets were found embedded in the bedroom floor. All three bullets were determined to have been fired by the gun found at Reeves' feet. Also unexplained were bruises found on Reeves' face and chest. Finally, he'd left no note and died naked, very unusual for a suicide. Some later reports state that the gun had been very recently oiled, which may have been the reason no fingerprints were found. The other bullets discovered in the room may have been fired at another time. And the bruises, and this is my own theory, may have occurred while Reeves was sparring for his upcoming boxing match. Reeves was naked, but he was also very drunk. And not every person who kills himself leaves a note. As for another person being responsible, one theory was that Lenore had a hand in Reeves' death, although she sought to gain much more from marrying him, or at least marrying him before she murdered him. She had come under suspicion after she broke past the crime scene tape to enter Reeves' home and take away over $4,000 in traveler's checks. She would explain her actions by claiming Reeves had purchased the traveler's checks for their upcoming honeymoon. But no one else had heard about plans for such a trip. They only knew of the upcoming promotional trip to Australia that was being paid for by the studio. Oh, and by the way, Reeves was reportedly being paid about $20,000 in today's money when he was hired for this promotion. So he was far from on the verge of being penniless, as some have claimed. Reeves' mother was told by her investigator that he'd discovered no compelling evidence to suggest that her son's death had been anything other than a suicide, and he closed his case. 
But the controversy around Reeves' death continues to this day. Other stories would emerge over the years. Phyllis Coates, the actor who portrayed Lois Lane, told the authors of the book Hollywood Kryptonite that she had received a phone call at 4.30 a.m. on the morning of Reeves' death. The call was from Tony Mannix. She was ranting and raving and saying, he's dead, he's been murdered. Some theorize that seeing his wife heartbroken, Eddie Mannix took matters into his own hands and had Reeves killed. Mannix, while virtually on his deathbed, had the power and the connections to make this happen. He'd grown up in Palisades Park, New Jersey, and had run with a lot of Irish and Jewish gangsters, including Bugsy Siegel. It was also rumored that Mannix had ties to L.A. mobsters, and the Los Angeles chief of police was a personal friend. Some even believed that he'd had his first wife killed in 1937. She had died in a car accident when her vehicle was run off the road. Perhaps Tony had asked for her ex-lover to be bumped off, or Mannix had decided to do so on his own. However, there was the problem of the witnesses who all said Reeves was alone. His room was located in the attic space of the second floor, with only one door leading up to it. It would have been nearly impossible for anyone to sneak in. Had there been another person in Reeves' home that night? If so, were the witnesses threatened or just too scared to say anything? As you can see, the death of George Reeves can be debated to this day. In 1999, a publicist named Edward Losey told the tabloid TV show Extra that Tony Mannix had confessed on her deathbed in 1983 that Mannix had had Reeves killed. All the mobsters involved in the plot, Losey said, were now dead, so he was no longer afraid to tell what he knew. However, Mannix had suffered from Alzheimer's disease for years and probably was not lucid in her last days. Losey's claims about this confession has not been corroborated by any other witnesses. There's a good movie that dramatizes the story of George Reeves' death and the story surrounding it. Titled Hollywood Land, it was released in 2006 and stars Ben Affleck as George Reeves and Diane Lane as Tony Mannix. It's worth watching. Interest in Superman was renewed in the late 1970s when the first of four films featuring the superhero was released. In 1978, the motion picture Superman, directed by Richard Donner, starred Christopher Reeve as Superman, Margot Kidder as Lois Lane, and also featured actors Marlon Brando, Gene Hackman, and Glenn Ford, among many others. It was a huge hit, earning over $300 million worldwide. It was nominated for three Academy Awards, including Best Film Editing, Best Music Original Score, and Best Sound, and received a Special Achievement Award for Visual Effects. But the Superman curse continued, with the release of Superman in 1978, and carried through with Superman 2's release in 1980, Superman 3 in 1983, and Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, in 1987. The first of the films told the origin story of Superman. Baby Kal-El, who is sent to Earth from Krypton and becomes Clark Kent and then Superman, was played by a seven-month-old baby from London, England, named Lee Quigley. The baby's parents were played by Susanna York and Marlon Brando. Lee Quigley is believed to be the first victim of the Superman curse from the film franchise when he died at the age of 14 after inhaling solvents. Playing the infant Superman was Quigley's only acting role. His best friend said he never told anyone about it, thinking that if the other boys knew he'd played Superman, they might want to fight him. For street cred, I assume, like in, I beat up Superman. Quigley's parents had split up when he was very young, and he'd been raised by his grandparents in Langley, Eastburn, England. After school one day in 1991, Quigley was walking with his friend to the shops in town. As they walked, according to the friend, Quigley was sniffing from an aerosol can with a cloth over the top of it to get high. His friend had tried to snatch the can from him when he began to, quote, appear drunk. He was able to get the boy to a friend's house, but soon after arriving, the teen collapsed. An ambulance was called, but Quigley could not be revived. Marlon Brando was said to also suffer from the Superman curse when a series of tragedies befell his family. In 1990, his son Christian Brando shot to death his sister Cheyenne's boyfriend, Dag Drollett, in the Brando home. Christian pled guilty to manslaughter and served five years in prison. Cheyenne was eight months pregnant at the time of Drollett's death. She suffered from mental illness throughout her life, 
and was admitted to a psychiatric hospital after the murder. She would later lose custody of her son, and in 1995, she hung herself at her mother's home in Tahiti. Christian Brando would later enter into a relationship with Bonnie Lee Bakley, who would subsequently marry Robert Blake. Bakley would tell both Brando and Blake that they were the father of her baby, but DNA results would determine that Blake was actually the father. He would marry Bakley, and in 2001, she would be found shot to death in Blake's car. Blake would be tried and acquitted of her murder. His defense attorneys would try to point the finger at Christian Brando as an alternate suspect in Bakley's murder. But the most well-known tragedy to emerge from the Superman film franchise was that of its star, Christopher Reeve. Christopher Reeve was born in 1952 in New York. He began acting at the age of nine, when he first appeared in school plays. As a teen, he was accepted as an apprentice at the Williamstown Theater Festival in Massachusetts, where he was praised for his talent by the actress Olympia Dukakis. Reeve attended Juilliard and was a successful stage actor playing opposite legendary talents like Katharine Hepburn, who became a mentor and close friend. He only had one small part in a Hollywood movie before being cast in the role of Superman for the 1978 film. He didn't think he had much of a chance upon hearing that the other actors who'd already been cast included Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor, but he flew to London to audition. Reeve was tall, six foot four inches tall to be exact, with an athletic build, a handsome face, and piercing blue eyes. The casting agent thought he embodied the Superman character and fought to have Reeve invited to read for the part. He, of course, won the role that would make him a star. He played the role of Superman in all four films between 1978 and 1987. He also acted in many other films, including Somewhere in Time, The Aviator in 1985, and The Remains of the Day in 1993. After first learning to ride horses on the television adaptation of Anna Karenina in 1985, Christopher Reeve began training, and by 1989, he was entering riding events. He purchased his own thoroughbred horse in 1994 and trained with him to compete at the Combined Training Association Finals in Vermont. On May 27, 1995, they were performing their third jump, a routine three-foot-three fence, when his horse began the jump and then stopped short. Reeves' hands became tangled in the reins as he flew forward, landing on his head on the far side of the fence. His first and second vertebrae were broken, which paralyzed him and stopped his breathing. Paramedics arrived within three minutes, and started him on oxygen. He was in and out of consciousness for days after the accident. When he finally regained full consciousness five days later, he was told that his first and second cervical vertebrae had been destroyed in the accident. He would not be able to walk again, but would most likely remain immobile from the neck down. He would later write in his book, Still Me, that he considered suicide and asked his wife Dana to consider taking him off life support. She was devastated by her husband's injury and terrified of losing him, but agreed that she would support him in whatever he decided to do. She told him she'd never leave him, and she loved him no matter what happened. You're still you, and I love you, she tearfully vowed to her husband. He decided to continue fighting to survive, and never considered euthanasia again. He first had to undergo surgery to repair his neck vertebrae. His skull had to be surgically reattached to his spine. It was a risky procedure, but Reeve came through it. After a prolonged period of rehab, he began to show some improvement and was eventually able to move his left index finger. With the help of electrodes attached to his hamstrings, quadriceps, and gluteal muscles, his legs were able to move the pedals they were attached to. Reeve decided to use his celebrity to advocate for stem cell research and place focus on spinal cord injuries. He even made a speech at the Democratic National Convention in 1996. He narrated the HBO film Without Pity, a film about abilities, which won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Informational Special. He even returned to work as a film director. In the Gloaming was released in 1997. Incredibly, he returned to the screen in 1998, starring in a remake of Rear Window, playing the role made famous by Jimmy Stewart in the 1954 Alfred Hitchcock film. He won a Screen Actors Guild Award for his performance. In the year 2000, Reeve was able to regain some motor function 
and could now sense hot and cold temperatures on his body. Christopher Reeve and his wife Dana remained active in helping others who are paralyzed. The Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Resource Center was created to teach paralyzed people to live more independently. His last role as an actor was playing Dr. Virgil Swan on the television series Smallville. In 2002 and 2004, he suffered serious infections thought to have originated from his bone marrow that were almost fatal. He was being treated for sepsis, a result of another infection. On October 4, 2004, he received an antibiotic for the infection, which resulted in Reeve going into cardiac arrest. He fell into a coma, and 18 hours later, on December 10, he died. He was 52 years old. He left behind three children, William, Matthew, and Alexandra. Dana Reeve was also said to have fallen prey to the Superman curse when she died just a year and a half after her husband at the age of 44. Dana, never a smoker, was diagnosed with lung cancer in August of 2005 and died less than a year later on March 6, 2006. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. There is one more story I want to share with you about the Superman curse. That is the tragic story of Margot Kidder, who portrayed Lois Lane to Christopher Reeve's Superman in all four films. But you can only hear that story if you become a Patreon member. For as little as $2 a month, you can become a super fan of Once Upon a Crime and get bonus content, merchandise, sneak peeks, and more. At the $5 level, you will receive an extra gift, and at the $10 level, you'll get everything I just mentioned, plus an exclusive gift and a personal note from me. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to support the show. Thank you so much. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Don't forget to subscribe to my other podcast, Let's Talk About True Crime, to hear fun discussions with special guest hosts about the hottest things trending in true crime. Subscribe to Let's Talk About True Crime wherever you listen to podcasts. That's Let's Taco, T-A-C-O, about true crime. Until next time, be good to one another. Thank you.